Hi, my name is Dr. Richard Abbey, and today I'm gonna to tell you all about ADHD, or is it ADD? Let's figure it out. So there's a lot of confusion about what the difference is between ADD and ADHD, attention deficit disorder versus attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We well, should know that the name has changed. So the outdated name is ADD, but most people refer to ADD as something you have if you don't have the H, the hyperactivity. Well, the new nomenclature is such that it's actually attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and there's three main types. The first type is when you have predominantly the inattentive type. So what does that mean? You can't focus over long periods of time. And what we really see, this is very important, is that your child can't focus for things that are not intrinsically interesting to them. So, you know, they can focus on video games, they can focus on movies and interesting books that they like, but it's the stuff that they don't really care about, the things that like the lectures they don't like, or maybe it's not, they're not a math person or a history person. And, you know, doing 10 minutes of homework takes hours and hours and they just can't seem to do it. Or they're making these errors. Uh, you know, they can do the math problems, but they forgot the sign, right? Or they do all their homework, uh, but they forgot to turn it in. So that's more of the inattentive, unorganized type. Now, the second type is predominantly impulsive and hyperactive type. Now, these kids are way easier to catch and find because they're very disruptive. These are the kids that are like going all around the room and, you know, teachers are having a hard time managing their behavior. They're running out into the road and you have to like kind of chase after them and keep track of them. So that's the ADHD predominantly impulsive hyperactive type. Now, the third type is that you have all three of these. So many kids have the inattentive type. Some of them have the predominantly impulsive and hyperactive type, and many also have the combined type. Uh, and so these are the three main factors. Just so you know, ADD is something that we talk to our clients about. They still use that term. We're happy to use it. But these are the proper terms if you're wondering what the difference is between ADD and ADHD. They're really synonymous. It's just depending on how technical you want to get. You should know that according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5, it's in the fifth uh, edition, that symptoms must start on or before the age of 12 years old. Now, we often can see in the clients that we work with that sometimes it's not obvious until later because many of the children we work with are very, very intelligent and so they can compensate for a long time. But when you look back hindsight and you think about the things that they were having trouble with, you can see those symptoms unfolding. The other criteria that must be included is that the symptoms that they're having must be inappropriate for their age. And so it's not that just, you know, somebody's hyperactive once in a while or once in a while they can't pay attention. These have to cause significant difficulties in at least two settings, home, school, maybe, you know, Cub Scouts or other things that are, they're doing has to affect them in many areas of their life. So here's the real big question. What causes ADHD? Is it nature, nurture, is it genetics, is it environment? Well, what we know and what the research says is that if a child has ADHD, there's a 50-50 chance that one of the parents has ADHD. So, you know, there's likely a good genetic component to it. What we also know is that if a sibling has ADHD, there's much higher likelihood that one of their other siblings would have it. In fact, when you have identical twins, the concordance rate of having ADHD is exponentially higher. However, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, which also brings into question, well, why is that? If you have the exact same genes, why doesn't uh, the twin have that condition? And the answer is because it's nature nurture. It could be genetic, it could be environmental, or actually it's a combination of those two things. So that's really uh, an interesting fact. There's an interaction between the environment and it's not always just about genetics or not just about the environment. So what we do know is that multiple genes are responsible for the production of certain neurons and certain neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters go from one neuron to the next neuron, and they're responsible for things like efficiency within the attention network. These messages from neuron to neuron can be seen kind of thinking about like a mailroom. So you have localization, 
in a particular mail room and you know you're sorting the mail and those messages can be seen as like specialized uh, special talents and things and so you can actually send that mail long distances like from California to New York and those would be messages sent throughout the brain and what we know about the attention network is this widely distributed predominantly in the frontal lobe but the concert and organization of the brain is super important in terms of the coordination and the timing and how it is running efficiently. One of the neurotransmitters that is very important is called dopamine. And this is important in things like reward and risk and impulsiveness. So that inhibitory control is super important. And some of our young people have this amazing brain. It's like they're driving around a Porsche 911 and they have bicycle brakes. And those bicycle brakes are not kind of stopping things in time and they're just blurting things out or doing things without thinking. So these are people who are like acting and then thinking later and then they have repercussions for that. That is a child who is extremely impulsive. And yet another neurotransmitter called norepinephrine is very important in attention and arousal. And the theories are that when we have too low of levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, this leads to things like impulsivity, hyperactivity, and inattention, especially for things that are not intrinsically interesting. So what are the cause of these lower levels of dopamine and norepinephrine? That's the rub. Most people don't know, and it's back to the nature-nurture debate. However, this leads to the treatments. In the treatments, there are many and controversial, and what do we do? And so there's been a huge paradigm shift in what you can do. Let's think about the old traditional methods. Uh, one of the ways you can treat ADHD is through medication. Now there's a number of treatments that are recommended for ADHD, behavioral psychotherapy, medication, these are very traditional models, and more recently, brain training. At the turn of the century, there was a vast amount of brain training that was coming into play, and it's been more widely researched over time. So let's cover each one of these in turn. Now, behavioral psychotherapy is something that is mainly aimed at children, but there's also methods that can be used for adults, but let's focus on children. So what do you do? In the classroom, you give them preferential seating. You remove the distractions so they're not sitting next to the window or the pencil sharpener and you might activate them and get them walking around in the classroom and handing out the papers or sharpening the pencil or erasing the blackboard. You may have also heard of ADHD executive function coaching or attention deficit hyperactivity coaching. These are things that also can be done and through a variety of techniques in terms of planning and organization, the idea behind this is scaffolding uh, these skills and being able to roll these out to compensate for these areas of weakness. The other thing that has been traditionally done over time is medication. So if medications are used, the most frequent and often one used is something like a stimulant. Uh, you know, many of you have probably heard of Ritalin and there's a whole host of other ones that are more uh, sustaining over time or some people might take a fast acting one and a booster uh, at the end of the day. And the way this works is, you know, you start with a low dose and they titrate up to the extent that you can tolerate the side effects while improving the function. So what we know as a center when we look at children's brains is we actually see an excessive amount of slow activity when we do brain mapping. And so the stimulant is gonna speed up that brain. The problem though, is that we actually don't see the connectivity metrics. In other words, if you have a hub of neurons here, a hub of neurons here that are important in the attention network, and they're poorly myelinated or they're not communicating well, medication doesn't seem to overcome that. And so that's why if you have a simple sustained attention problem, medication can help with that as long as the medication is within the child's body and fully activated. Uh, what tends to happen is over time that dissipates and so the medication effects will kind of uh, start to drop off toward the end of the day, especially during homework time. So the options are take a little bit of a booster, but the problem with that is you start to tend to get um, things like insomnia or suppressed appetite 
and that's right around meal time. So it's real kind of tricky to balance these things, but working with a good psychiatrist, often you can help uh, in many ways do those things. Now, the real interesting thing is that ADHD medication is very similar to illicit drugs like methamphetamines with one key difference. The uh, stimulant medication is this very slow release over time. Whereas the illicit drug, the methamphetamine, is very fast. Uh, and so it gives you this huge boost of dopamine, which can lead to a variety of problems. So the key difference between medication, prescribed medication, and methamphetamines is the quickness of release. So methamphetamines can actually cause this euphoria and cause people to alter their thinking and maybe have some bad decisions where ADHD medication is slowly released over time and really seems to help people uh, maintain and focus their simple sustained attention. Now, what we find is that this absolutely does not help things like working memory. How do we know? Because we actually test people and they come up with a diagnosis and then we retest them and their working memory doesn't change, their executive functions don't change unless they're short-circuited by their simple sustained attention. And in the majority of people that we work with, that just simply isn't the case. So, you know, when you're thinking about what to do, it's not like categorical. You do one thing or the other. You can do multiple things. In fact, if there's a particular timeline, uh, you might choose like medication with the thought of, over time, maybe you will kind of titrate that down because you could do other things, right? And what would those other things be? The third thing that we need to talk about is brain training. Now, at the turn of the century, a man by the name of Torko Klingberg, amazing man out of Stanford, uh, invented a working memory training program. And this was just this amazing program that would help people focus their attention through holding information in their mind mentally manipulating it, whether it be auditory or visual information or a combination of those things, and stretching their brains as much as they could for 25 to 30 minutes, five days a week for eight weeks. Now, doing this, can you imagine the importance of working memory is actually the biggest predictor of academic success. And this is the working space that we use for imagination, for reading comprehension, for uh, solving complex problems for doing mental math, all these things. So you can imagine it's very, very important. Other things that have existed since, really since the 1960s, Barry Sturman started things like neurofeedback and Joel Lubar in the 1970s extended this research into ADHD. Robert Thatcher in the 1990s took over this research and with a, grant, a multi-million dollar grant with the National Institute of Health, made this amazing database where they actually did comprehensive neuropsych testing and brain maps. So they have this database. You can compare each child by age band. So you could look at seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds, compare them to other children who don't have attention problems. And so you can see specifically what part of the brains are affected. And more importantly, you can use that information in real time to train somebody's brain. What do I mean by that? So now if you have this brain computer interface and you can sample at 128 times a second and reflect that information back to that person, then they can understand when they get better. So when your brain is actually just kind of idle, it will go through a series of getting better, getting worse, getting better, getting worse. And if you can show that person when it's getting better and they can hold that better performance for a quarter second time. Uh, you can reward them instantaneously. And so now you have this simple model of operant conditioning. When the behavior gets better, and if you can think of the brain as behavior, uh, and that gets better, you reward that instantaneously and you're giving them the signal. So it's almost like this amazing Jedi Knight training where they're learning how to improve their mind control. How does this work? Within your brain, you have cells called oligodendrocytes, and the oligodendrocytes are filled with fatty tissue. Now that fatty tissue will myelinate these things called axons. So you have a hub of neurons here, hub of neurons here, and you have 
communication wires called axons. Now, if they're poorly myelinated, like an attention network system, for example, and you start to use them over and over, your oligodendrocytes will start to wrap around myelin sheathing around them, and it can improve neurotransmission by up to a thousand times faster so that attention network can get better. But neuroplasticity isn't just like for brain training. Or it's if you learn a new language, if you learn how to ride a bike, if you learn how to play piano, you're using neuroplasticity to lay down the tracks that would be important. So circling back to that stagnation in children and that development, if they can improve their development in these specific areas, and we're talking about attention networks, executive function networks, and build these brain areas up, they actually can get exponentially better. So if you do that, and then you circle back to things like ADHD coaching, executive function coaching, or even put them through a brain gym. So you're performing and concentrating on things like uh, focusing and paying attention, back to Torkel Klingberg, on expanding that working memory. Now you can actually train better control over the brain. So like I said, it's really a choice. And it may be that, you know, hey, we're headed into ninth grade or we're heading into college this fall. We don't have a lot of time to do the brain training or we, we are taking the bar exam, for example, or uh, uh, high school entrance exam. Next week, brain training takes a few months. So you might wanna look into getting something that would be more fast acting. And as time goes on, you might do brain training and combine all these things, ultimately without medication, have a better brain. But the choice is really individual. Uh, you know, are you the pill person? If you have, you know, high blood pressure, are you the person that says, hey, where's the pill? I'm good. Are you the person that says, hey, I wanna exercise and diet and get through the high blood pressure and correct that? And what do you want for your child? So we have a lot of different options. We work directly with psychiatrists. We work directly with psychologists. We have a whole team of uh, brain trainers. And these are the things and all the options that you can do today to help overcome ADHD. So I hope you enjoyed it. These are uh, some basic principles about ADHD. If you have any questions, give us a call. Watch some more videos uh, we'll have coming up um, and send us your questions.